Nick Blevins, welcome to the Youth Ministry in Motion podcast. Glad you're here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about this today, uh, talking about volunteers, because I have been really, really blessed to have some very good volunteer teams uh, in my youth ministry journey. Lots of great volunteers, lots of great meetings at my house with, with adults who loved young people and uh, food and, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and I love your take in your book, uh, the Volunteer Playbook, which is uh, just an amazing resource. But before we get into that, um, I need to know your origin story. And I'm sure people that are watching, people that are listening, because the, uh, you know, I believe that all youth pastors are superheroes and all superheroes have origin stories. So how did we get here? How did we, how did we uh, start in the, uh, get to this youth ministry place here that you're at? Yeah, I grew up attending church ever since I was two and then had a great youth pastor. I know a lot of people that's part of their story. My youth pastor, Jeff, was the youth pastor. I didn't get really involved when I was in middle school. That's one of the regrets that I have. It was one of those things where I went to Sunday morning, Sunday school, even went to Wednesday night. But youth ministry was was Friday night. I was introverted, kind of avoided that because I didn't know if I knew anybody you know, the whole thing. And my youth pastor, actually, who I didn't really know at the time, showed up at my friend's house one summer, coming to my house to invite me to come to youth ministry that fall as it was kicking off again. I think I was going into ninth grade or going in eighth grade. I can't remember. But either way, I hadn't been involved at that point. And then once I did, I loved it. Right. And like, I can't sure. believe I, it took that long to go and did trips and, you know, it changed my life. And, and then quickly after graduating high school, either when I was a senior or right after, uh, there had been some ways that I had volunteered as a senior, as a high school student, my youth pastor had got me into some of that. And then after I graduated, I was asked to like be a part of VBS and teach some kids. It was the first time I ever thought maybe I'd actually be interested in teaching the Bible. And it was pursuing, you know, my college degree, but volunteered in so many different roles. And then my youth pastor went on to be a pastor at another church in the area. And I'm very blessed because he still lives near me today. So we have, we get together three, four times a year. It's just great. And, and anyway, once, when he moved to that church, you know, there was a void there. And so myself and others, we stepped in to help lead the youth ministry at the time. And, um, and it, it's, you know, I grew up in a church where there was a, probably more ministries than people to serve in them kind of thing, you know, like one of those deals. Good, so sure. I mean, th- there was a time we were young adults. It's like we had more time on our hands. We were leading youth ministry and upward sports camp or, you know, program that we had at our church, a young adult service. Like it was silly, you know, how many things we were involved in there, but that gave me a glimpse of that. We had another youth pastor come in that got hired and helped him a lot, but then he moved on probably a couple of years later. So there was just a, a season there by seven years where we were leading youth ministry a lot and loved it. And I really did love it. And it wasn't until near the end of that, that I thought maybe I'd want to do this, you know, as my job instead of, you know, I was, I was at the time working at North of Grumman, a big defense contractor. And it was my youth pastor who asked me if I would become, come be his youth pastor at his church that he had moved to. The, and the problem was, I was my wife and I have been praying for a while about helping a church plant. We felt like our area, I live here north of Baltimore, Maryland. This was 20 years ago. We felt like our area needed more new churches that you know you could invite your friends to. And, and the home church I grew up in was awesome, changed my life, but it was somewhat traditional. And even my youth pastor's church that he went to, like he was hoping to take it somewhere, but it was a little traditional. And so in my head, I thought... I, w- I might want to entertain, you know, vocational ministry, but <clears throat> at a church plant, if I could, and, you know, long story short, a church plant was getting started uh, that same, well, I guess it was the next year. And we heard about it, asked questions, felt like it was an answer to our prayers and they needed a part-time kids pastor. And I thought, well, I'd mostly done youth ministry, but I don't think it's that different. And, you know, <laughs> jumped in there, did that. And then, you know, eventually oversaw kids and students. That's still what I do today. And, you know, as a next gen pastor, you spend seasons where you're neck deep in kids or neck deep in students and, and then, you know, other things that like you and I were talking about. So yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. And here we are, my gosh, 20 some years later. So in your journey then in doing that, how did you develop a passion for volunteers? I mean, uh, and, and, and training these volunteers, how did that come about? Yeah, great question. I think so when I was going back to when I was at my home church and leading youth ministry and some other things as a volunteer, um, I guess somehow during that time in my life, I was probably 21, 22, something like that. And I just got interested in, 
I would call it ministry strategy, even though I didn't even know that would be a phrase or whatever. I think part of it was I didn't have any help. It's like uh, there was nobody, you know, saying, hey, here's how to do this. My my um, father-in-law was the pastor of the church. My wife and I hadn't been married yet. But a year after my youth pastor left, he took a lead pastor job in Richmond, Virginia. He's still there to this day. And so then you're talking about church didn't have a pastor or a youth pastor. Okay. So like, I, I think for me, it was like, I just need to learn how to do this. Well, I, I was always a systems minded, strategy minded kind of person. And so I thought, what can I do here? So I read Purpose Driven Youth Ministry, right? Right. Like the uh, quintessential book there. And that was that was helpful because for me, that opened up the doors. My church was um, getting into Purpose Driven Church. We went to that conference. My friend was attending North Point Community Church in Atlanta as he was working for the North American Mission Board which was next door and you weren't supposed to attend North Point, by the way, uh, because it wasn't a Baptist church. So anyway, just just outed him here on their podcast. Anyway, (laughs) and at the time he was attending there, you know, Louis Giglio was there doing the Tuesday night 722 thing. And my friend went to that. And so here I am like reading these books from Saddleback and Purpose Driven and all that, reading books from North Point and Andy Stanley. And and they were just, again, I would put them in the category of like ministry strategy. And I loved it. I mean, I ate it up. It was like, this is great. I love that somebody's given you like a plan and here's how to do this well. And I think I needed it because Jennifer, my wife and I were involved in all these different ministries that needed volunteers. And it was like any other church. Like we didn't have enough volunteers to go around one because we were doing too many things, but you know, also because some of those things were new or, or whatever. And so getting in and learning that stuff in the book made me passionate about that. And then actually applying the principles and seeing it work, you know what I mean? Even as a volunteer, it's like, this is good. This is good stuff, you know? And so a lot of it is like, it's my story. It's how I got to get into vocational ministry. It's how I got learned what I was passionate about or gifted in and what I wasn't gifted in. And so then ever since then, I just have loved doing that same thing for volunteers. We had a coach meeting last night at our church, which is basically volunteers who lead other volunteers. And it was our first one since pandemic. And it's our fault that we let it go that long without it. And I just left being encouraged. Like they, they, it was great for the volunteers, you know, to have that time together, to be reminded of what their job is and why they do that. And, and so, and we sometimes we just take that for granted, you know? So I think I love it because even for me, it makes me more passionate about my role in serving and able to do it better. Yeah, I, I tell you what, and when I read your book, when I, when I read your book, The Volunteer Playbook, I love, I'm an X's and O's guy. And this is really, and, and you know, this podcast is really about X's and O's. It's really about the how-tos, it's implementation, uh, you know, it's what I do on YouTube as well. I love answering questions. I love going through all that. And uh, And I will say this, that your book, uh, stretch my brain a little bit because you you have math in there. There's there's math, and I'm I going. Do have math in there. Wait a minute. There's math in there, and I'm like, first of all, I'm not a math guy, but I am a strategy guy. So I am. Int- I, I don't like I don't like algebra, but I like statistics. I don't I don't like you know geometry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I get you. But I like but I like looking at percentages and uh-huh. and things of that nature that make sense to my brain. Yeah, uh, because it tells me something. It paints a picture for me. And so, uh, but the, but, but you are, uh, you, the book itself is just a, a great example of processes and those things. And I want to get into those right now. So where should I, use, well, let me just ask this first. Well, uh, we've all heard this, but go ahead and break down some terrible ways to do. I know there's people wanting, there's people watching, people listening. So I need volunteers right now, Paul. Summer is happening <laughs> and mm-hmm. they will resort to terrible ideas for recruiting. They need VBS volunteers. They need uh, summer things that are going on. And I know that youth pastors, sometimes when they get in a panic, they will resort to terrible ideas. So can we just tell the youth pastors and, and, that are, and youth workers that are watching now, let's stay away from some of these ideas before you do anything. Yes. And some of these, I think you could just stay away from in general. Some of them, I think you could come back to if you have a good solid recruiting base in place. And we could talk about that a little bit later, but you know, because like, for example, an announcement from stage isn't terrible as a recruiting idea. I think a lot of people listening have done it and realized sometimes it's not very effective. You know, for every 10 people that raise their hand and say, yeah, I'll serve. And, you know, like two of them make it. Yeah. Um, and there's a way to improve that. So it's not that that's terrible, but it is probably terrible without something else to go with it. Certainly anytime you're it's a desperate need kind of thing. 
is a terrible thing, whether that's from a stage or even in person, like, hey, Paul, in the lobby, I'm drowning. You know, can you, you know, and you'll get, I mean, again, people that have the gift of mercy, like, they're, you know, you'll get, you can get some people <laughs> that way, but it's not exactly the, the people that you want. And so I think those are a couple ways that, you know, if you're going to recruit, it's probably not going to be quite as effective. I would even say this, and this is, again, there's a version of this that works, but it's a terrible way to recruit. Like one of the worst ways to recruit volunteers is to only ask as many people as you need. So if you need five more volunteers, if you only ask five people, well, that's, that's not a good way to recruit. What are the chances that hundred percent of them say yes, you know, going back to the math thing. So I think some of it is what's a good consistent plan you can recruit. And then there's, there is lots of ways that you can supplement that like an announcement from stage or something on the website or something on social media. But I think any of those by themselves without the recruiting base, mm -hmm. usually in my experience, don't work as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, and, and uh, you know, I know people are getting ready for summer now. When should they have started? When should they have started their volunteer <laughs> for their volunteer drive? Just so they have uh, an idea for next year. When yeah. should they be starting the volunteer drive for whatever it is they're needing? If it's a big event or whatever. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, because a lot of it has to do with onboarding, right? Like how fast do you onboard? And and uh, like I know in our world, my youth pastor and at our church, we, we're always trying to recruit for fall small group leaders now, you know, and even last month. And so April, May, trying to get them to say yes. In some ways, I don't know. This isn't on purpose, but as I'm talking about this, I'm wondering about it in my head. I wonder if it's even easier for people to say yes now for something that doesn't start in three months. You know what I mean? Because our student ministry takes a break during the summer. So I don't know. The reason we do it now is because we don't want to get to August second week and you still don't have, you know, a yeah. sixth grade yeah. guys, small group leader or something like that. So, but if it was just for summer, if it was for an event, I think it comes down to how long do you need to onboard and train them? Uh, I was in a breakout session that Doug Fields led just a few weeks ago at the Orange Conference, speaking of purpose-driven youth ministry. And I thought he had a great answer to a question. I don't even remember the question, but the his answer was about onboarding. And his point was, if we, like with our normal process, with their normal process, he's, you know, still helping at Mariners now, they could onboard a volunteer in like two weeks from like application to like serving. But his point was, if you don't feel good about that person, like if there's something weird, they give you the heebie-jeebies. I think he said, um, he's like, I can stretch it out and make it take six months. Like you need you to go to that class. You got to be a part of that group. You got to, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I the, love extend the vetting. Extend the vetting process if you need. Yes, to. yeah. And even told a story about one time when they, I mean, they did sort of that, and it kept somebody out that was a predator. You know, and wow. and and so that that's really important. But the thing that I liked about how he talked about it is. You, I don't think you want your normal onboarding process to be eight weeks. That's how you lose people. You know, like I, I hear, I was sometimes working with church leaders. They'll say, hey, for every 10 people that say yes to serving in student ministry, only about four of them actually end up serving. And that's always a red flag for me because I'm like, really? Because that, that's, that's kind of low. Like I would think once they say yes, and like in our church, probably nine out of 10 end up serving. You know what I mean? So that's kind of weird for me to only have four. So what's what's happening there? Is the process too long? Is it too complicated? Are we not following up enough? So I am an advocate for a fast onboarding process as long as you know we're doing the vetting, right? Yes. And we're asking us things. And so so if you could if you could vet, if, if you could you know get them serving in two weeks, and in our world we try to do an apprenticeship where they get apprenticed for four another four weeks. I mean, you know, six weeks would be enough for us to recruit. Now, if it's the if it's a small group leader who's gonna serve all year in the fall, then you know, yeah, you probably need to be months out, three, four months out is, is better. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, it sounds pretty standard that you should be recruiting three months ahead of whatever it is you're trying to achieve because you do have to go through that vetting process. You should have that problem, which we're going to get into that process that you want your volunteers to go through. You don't want to just throw bodies at a situation, especially if you want to carry on with those volunteers and you want to be able to uh, uh, develop them and so forth. So let's go ahead and break down then if we can break it down. So if a, a, so where should a youth pastor start when they're thinking about adding volunteers to their team? And if you could break it down from maybe a small church, you're talking about a hundred people or less, then you got your, your mid range people, maybe 350, 250, 350 to 500 maybe, or maybe 500 and above is probably the upper length there. 
but uh, 500 above. But if you could break down what that would look like from a small church, medium church, and a larger church. Yeah, and the good news is actually what I teach in the book and what we use at our church is the same. It's the same regardless of church size. The math is different, right? Because the numbers are larger, but the process is the same. And so, I mean, I can try to quickly walk through what I talk about in the book. Oh, please Again, do. There's, there's lots of ways you can re recruit volunteers. But I, one of the things that I like is having a consistent, repeatable process where you could basically be recruiting all year long. Now, are you actually recruiting every single week? No. But when I talk with church leaders, you know, I ask how many hours a week do they spend recruiting? Most of them say zero. So that's obviously a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and when I say most, I mean like 80% plus say zero. And then some of them say one and, and very few say two or more <clears throat> hours a week. So the, the book outlines a five part framework. All it is, is five steps. Like how do you start with people who aren't serving and then basically get put, you know, invite them to take a step and then another step and then another step knowing that it's almost like a funnel in sales or something like that, where you're going to put a bunch of people in the top, you know, only a fraction of them are going to take the next step and only a fraction of them are going to take the next step. So the way we talk about it in the book and in our courses with Ministry Boost is if you need to recruit, let's say you're the small church and you need six volunteers, you need 60 prospects. You need 10 times. 10x is the number. That's where some of the math is in the book. So however many volunteers you need, you need 10 times that number of prospects. And prospects are just people who could serve meaning they're not serving anywhere else right now, but that's it. We haven't qualified them any other way. We haven't put them through a vetting. You don't have to know them. They're just people that could serve. And when I work with smaller churches on this, a lot of times they'll say, like I've had a church say, I need 13 volunteers. That's 130 prospects. My church only averages 130, <laughs> you know, and they're like, something's not going to work in the math here. And we could spend a long time talking about this, but my quick answer to that is, well, if your church averages 130, there's probably at least 200 people that call that church home that come regularly, at least, you know, once or twice a month, maybe even 300, you know, now that in pandemic. Now, the smaller church is usually the better the frequency of attendance is. But so like when you think, oh, there's only 130, there's not really only 130, there's probably 200, maybe even 300. So your church database is your friend here, even if you're in a larger church, church databases are never church leaders friends. Uh, pretty much all, all of us hate our church database. And a lot of church databases aren't updated, but yes. ideally what would you would have is you would have your database would tell you who's serving. So then you could search for everybody who's not serving. That's some, ver some kind of active they're attending, they're in a group, they give whatever. And so like, if you needed seven volunteer, you know, volunteers, and so then you need 70 prospects, ideally you'd be able to search in your database, get 70 people who aren't serving and you, and the way we teach it in the book is you email them. And you email them and you can invite them to either a conversation or straight to an orientation, like a volunteer orientation. And when I say orientation, a lot of people will probably think about like after somebody has said yes to serving, we're going to give you, you know, we're going to give you your orientation. Like if you got a new job, you don't, you know, the orientation is after you've gotten hired. We kind of use the term orientation for like a sneak peek, a preview before you've said yes. In fact, the orientation is like a sales pitch almost. It's like, here's, here's what student ministry looks like at our church. And, you know, here's our, the core principles about it. Here's why we do what we do. Here's how it works. Here's the different volunteer roles you can serve in. And then you tell stories about life change. You know what I mean? Like last year we baptized 27 students, 18 of those were baptized by their small group leader. Like, you know, like whatever that is. Right. And right. so for us, the orientation is a vision pitch. So you email this list and here's how the math works. If you email 70 people, 70 prospects, like four, like, I don't know, maybe you'll get 12 back. If that the first time, maybe even like six, seven, like sometimes it's not a lot. That's why you need so many prospects. Yeah. And then I teach that you email again the next week, everybody who didn't reply and you'll get another six or seven, you know, so you might've heard from like 13 people, let's say out of 70 at this point. And then we do teach if you need, still need to, you can always send a text, you know, another week later. So you've sent two emails and a text to these people, inviting them to a conversation or straight to an orientation. And hopefully you'll get 10, 12, 15 of them to reply. And at that point, you're talking and you're here, you listen to them, their story, how they find a way to your church, how's their faith journey going, what's their experience been like. And obviously, if you know them, 
you're adjusting this a little bit, right? I'm not like, hey, Paul, I'm Nick. And it's just all generic, you know what I mean? Like, I'd be like, hey, Paul, how are you doing? How's, how was that trip you, you were taking a couple months ago? Yeah. Hey, wanted to catch up and talk about um, some things. Like my normal email, if I don't know you, would be, hey, hey, Paul, I'm Nick, one of the pastors on staff here at CCC. I would love to meet you and hear about your story and how you found your way to our church. I'd also love to hear about how your experience has been. Could we chat for 15 minutes before or after a service this Sunday? What do you think? Right. And, and then if you don't reply, like if you're one of the people that don't reply the next week, I usually do a little hack because I'm sending this through a mass email thing through our church database. Right. But you don't have to do it. If the numbers are low enough, I would encourage you to send them manually, like individually. But if it's large scale, and I do a little hack where I make it look like it's a reply to that first email, put a little R E in the subject yeah. and include yeah, yeah, yeah. the original below. And it works like in most email clients, it works. And I just say, Hey, Paul, I want to know if you saw my email below. Love would love to talk this Sunday. So like I do that next week if you don't reply. Right. And then of course the text is another thing. And so once you do that, you're getting, I mean, the whole point is get, you know, get in a conversation with, if you need seven volunteers, try to get in a conversation with like 15 of them, like try to get in a conversation with more than seven, certainly. Yeah. Because yeah. again, not all of them are going to be, you know, want to serve. And for some of them, serving is not going to be their best fit. Like the way I say it is, you, this is where we have, we pastor them. It's not just about recruiting them. We want to help them take their best next step. And that could be serving in youth ministry. It could be getting in a small group or getting in a care group. You know, somebody tells you just went through the divorce and you're like, you know what? We've got divorce care starting up in uh, six weeks. I think that'd be a great place for you to go. Um, it could even be serving in another ministry that, you know, if we play, be the team player and put our church wide hat on, you, you might, you're talking with somebody. It's like, sounds like you would really love elementary. You know, let me, let, let me introduce you to our children's pastor. So, you know, and in a perfect world, church staff are all doing this together and they're helping each other kind of thing, you know, and our church has done that and it's, it's great. I mean, we just had a meeting the other day where we, um, you know, it was a little tense moment where like one of the best elementary volunteers was being recruited by student ministry, but wanted to be recruited by student ministry. So like now turns out actually at that meeting last night, we found out he's not going to go to student ministry. So my kid's pastor was very happy, but that's happened. You know, it happens all the time. And so anyway, so that's kind of the most of the framework, the, you know, you reach out to them. They're just prospects at that point. You get them to a conversation, invite them to an orientation where you cast a vision for like, this is why. You want yeah. to serve in student ministry, and this is the difference it makes. And after that, you're just onboarding them and placing them. But that number of 70 in the beginning, you know, you only hear from 15, maybe 10 of them say yes to come into the orientation, and you get nine of the 10 to serve. And now you got nine new volunteers when you were looking for seven. If your church is larger, then the numbers just go up, right? Like you maybe you needed 23 volunteers, and so you need 230 prospects or, or whatever. We just... Uh, my business partner, Kenny Conley, and I just worked with a church in uh, Colorado, large multi-site church. I think they have 30 staff just in kids and students across all their campuses and things. And we taught them this process. And it was really cool because we had them tell us how many volunteers they need to recruit. And they have essentially like about 700 and some volunteers, and they need another 305. So they need to recruit <clears throat> 305 volunteers. And so we're like, y'all need 3000 prospects. You know what I mean? Now their church is large. So that, you know, that those numbers are there. Yeah. 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 Not just in attendance, but on their database, which I love because, mm -hmm. you know, the several things that we've said here, it's like, how much time do you spend on recruiting? That doesn't mm -hmm. mean like going up to uh, at the pulpit and saying, well, how many times are you getting up there making a pitch to your congregation? Yeah. Yeah. Everything here is number one. Have you looked at your database lately? Have you looked at your church database? That's part of recruiting, right? It's not just verbal going one-to-one -to, -one to people. It's like, not, not how much time do you spend in relational asking, but how much homework are you doing, right? Are you looking at your database, right? Are you emailing, then creating emails that are uh, going to get people interested in, in, you know, what you're doing, creating an orientation meeting, right? For people to come up. That's all part yeah. of recruiting. That's it is. fine. So if you say, yeah. You're spending, you could easily spend two hours a week doing the things right here that you just said uh, oh, to, yeah. to create that, um, uh, you know, and, and the fact that you, uh, I love also the fact that, listen, your role as a, as a pastor is that these are 
you know, these aren't just volunteers. These are people on a journey. And you're, this is part of discipleship process that you're helping them not just be a part of your ministry. You're helping them find what they need because you're going to hear something in a conversation. I'm going through a divorce. I'm having, you know, you're going to pick up on some things that maybe they're not healthy enough in a place to, for this, or they're not knowledgeable enough for something that you're asking them for. And you think that before they enter in, maybe this class would do them great. Maybe this, you also pick up in these conversations that, listen, maybe they're not the best fit for you, but they're, but they're a great fit for that other ministry in your church. Cause what you're hearing is you really love this. You responded to the email out of mercy. <laughs> you said, well, I want to help, but really where your heart is, you'd rather just be an usher. You just want to greet people. You want to talk to people. I think that's where, you know, and that, that is such a great broad perspective because so many youth pastors want, want, want grab, grab, grab. I, mean, I love the illustration of your, you know, that basically uh, everybody on staff is a headhunter, right? Everybody, everybody's, uh, everybody's saying, listen, mm -hmm. uh, we have pizza every week. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Whereas the children's ministry has candy. Yeah. yeah. So, what, what's your preference? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. What, that's right. What do you really want? <laughs> yeah. What do you, what do you really want? Yeah. And I in a perfect world, you're all helping each other. Yes. But if you just do this on your own, it is an advantage, quite honestly, because now all the prospects are yours. You're not, you know what I mean? You're not, yeah. you know, you're not competing, especially student ministry. I always say that, like our staff at our church know that I believe student ministry is the biggest volunteer commitment in the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, are there exceptions where like, hey, this volunteer does 20 hours in this role? Sure. But just in general, student ministry is the largest commitment in the church. Therefore, it is the hardest thing to say yes to. So like, I, you know, my friend, Kenny, who I mentioned in my business partner, he's always done these primarily just with kids and maybe with students. Um, I have let our staff to do them all together where our whole staff does it. He likes just having kids and students do it together because sure, if you're doing orientations, it's way easier for somebody to say yes to serving once a month as an usher than it is two hours a week, two and a half hours a week in student ministry, plus trips, plus, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's now... Yeah. Uh, now, part of, in our church, one of the things we kind of acknowledge is, well, if you're starting out serving, maybe something like a once a month on, on our guest services is the step for you. But get, we view that as a first serve opportunity. And people, most people, not all of them, but most of them aren't going to stay there forever. They probably do need to graduate, so to speak, into some other opportunities. So student ministry does recruit, you know, need to recruit differently there because I think it's good to have some like first serve opportunities in student ministry. Like, do you have a welcome team? I guess, do you have hospitality or food or events or something where it's like easy to serve right out the gate without much experience, but a lot of student ministry roles. And this is where I love student pastors. They're, they're getting, in some ways you got to get the best of the best, you know, cause you got people that need to be committed, leading students <laughs> showing up in their life in at church and outside of church. Yeah. And this process still works for that. I think what happens though, is sometimes you might, your prospect pool, you might already like limit it down to people you already are, are know are some level of committed, yeah. you know, because you know the commitment level you're going to ask for is so strong yeah. that, that, you know, you you start there. You may not just ask everybody. So that, that's just another tip to think about when it comes to yeah. student ministry specifically. Well, that reminds me of the quote. Uh, if you want to get, if you want to, if you want to get something done, ask a busy person. Have you ever, if, <laughs> uh -huh. they, yeah, sure. Because they already understand what that means when you're asking for commitments and you're asking for to find somebody who's already doing something because they're clearly involved at some yeah. point. Uh, yeah, and, and I really and I think like you were saying, we were talking about hey, if we're all doing this together and student ministry, hey, we have pizza, kids ministry, have candy. There, there is the reality that if you if you do this with your staff, you you are competing that way. And there's also the reality that you're pushing people. I mean, a little bit, right? To take steps. And I think you have to be more bold now than before pandemic because people are more guarded with their time. And what I always say is that's okay. We're not selling timeshares. Like this matters. Like, And it's good for your faith development. It's going to be amazing for these students. Like <clears throat> be bold. Don't be afraid to push people. I mean, essentially what the way I phrase it is like, we all have our priorities and if they're in good order, you know, there's God and our family and our faith. And, 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 but right after that is somewhere in there serving with church. Like it's not 27th on the list. You know, it's not after my kid's soccer, my kid plays club soccer. Yeah. It's not after his soccer. You know what I mean? It's not after my lawn. 
It's not after, you know what I mean? Like in my oh, mind, yeah. and maybe I'm biased because I work for a church, but it's like, it's really high up the list. Like it's a top five item is serving as part of our faith. And so don't, don't be afraid to challenge people in that. You get, there's a point where you don't push too much, you know, but That's, I feel like we don't even come close to that. You know, yeah, no, there's people who just guilt people out and just, and just say, you know, you know, listen, I know little Johnny plays soccer, but you know, we got, you know, we have issues over here that, you know, don't really compare. Okay. So let's Is soccer getting him into heaven. No, I'm just kidding. For but, me, it's yeah. not even, I wouldn't even probably never even get specific about sure that like in my head, I'm thinking that, That's but right. for them, for them, I'm just thinking, I'm going to ask, I pushed, uh, actually there's a guy in our church. I was kind of pushing him on two fronts because one, I thought he should serve in our student ministry. And two, his daughter was going into sixth grade and she should go to student ministry. And they were talking, you know, student pastors have heard this before. Our student ministry meets on Sunday nights and people are like, oh, he's like, that's a family night. And I'm like, I get that. And and reality is student Sunday night stinks for parents, it is awful for parents. <clears throat> yeah. It is amazing for our student ministry, though, because we never compete with sports. We ne- You know what I mean? Like, yeah. So, and it's so it's like it's bad for parents. It's great for the student ministry. It's great for consistency. And I pushed him. Cause I'm like, not even just for serving, like your daughter needs to be there. Yeah. Uh, move, make your family night a different night, you know? And, and, and eventually, you know, he didn't, he actually didn't take the step. So like we hit a point where I backed off, but you know, it was, it wasn't one thing I pushed like three times, you know, because, yeah. and I didn't feel bad about it. Cause I'm like, you're going to decide for yourself. That's right. I just so strongly believe that when your daughter's 20, if she has never gone to student ministry here, you're you're going to regret that. Now you might not, and there might be people listening who even disagree with me. Sure. But I and I thought, and if she's going to go, why not serve? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he's looking, you know, he's looking to, yeah, he's looking to serve. You're going to be out anyway. Like, come on now. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's it is a. Uh, by the way, another uh, headhunter tip I would say: um, you want to kind of bribe your your greeters um, to make sure that they mention youth ministry have you seen nice. so just want to put that out there okay you well and you do have to be a little more intentional unless your student ministry meets during services which yeah. some do but yeah. if you're like my church where it meets wednesday night or sunday night or whatever yeah. you do have to be more intentional about making it visible okay. like we do volunteer tours that's something i teach in the book and and you can't tour student ministry on sunday morning so like you got to be we have to be more intentional about talking about it that's right and, um in fact one of the ideas that we came up with was as we're doing tours and showing people all the environments, let's go to this one room that isn't used primarily on Sunday mornings. We, we, have, we, don't, we don't have a lot of empty space on Sunday at our church, but there's this one room that if there's not a class going on, it's available. And so like on during tours now, let's roll um, video and picture stuff on those TVs of student ministry. And like, that's how they can see it is in that room. Talk about it, point to the TV yeah. just to, just to give something. Cause you don't get that same experience since you, you're not, you know, you're not touring on Sunday night kind of thing. But another practical tip, maybe youth pastors are going, well, how, how often um, should I have meetings with my staff, with my volunteers? Um, and maybe, you know, how long should they be? Uh, and some key things, you know, to cover in those meetings, you know, I, I, you know, I think for me, we always met what's, you know, once a month because things move fast in youth ministry. Uh, so we said once a month and it was a meal at our house. And we covered whatever, but I'd love to hear your perspective on on maybe what you know youth pastors should start at and say, hey, I need to need to meet with my guys. How often? What do we cover? That kind of thing. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you know what's interesting? I'd be curious to hear some of your listeners' thoughts on this and your thoughts on this. I interviewed Reed Moore on my podcast years ago. Reed is now the lead pastor of Gwinnett Church, but at the time he was the student pastor. And um I want to say, I'd have to go back and listen. I feel like he, they did a volunteer training. Like every week you came to a meeting that was an hour before the thing started. And I thought, wow, that is like aggressive, <laughs> you know, like, it is. And, and now they built an awesome culture because they're hanging out together all the time. You know what I mean? Like, so there was a benefit in the book, in the chapter on training, I kind of present, and this isn't like, Hey, you should do it this way. This was just like one idea. Yep. Here's a year long strategy. And the strategy was, Train your volunteers weekly in huddles, meaning get them together 30 minutes before they serve, 20 minutes before they serve, whatever, for 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. And you and that, and a lot of leaders, a lot of ministry leaders do that. And they use that for information, vision, they'll pray together, but get in some training there. Like get, you know, get a book and, and then for six months, talk about it in little five minute 
pieces. That's one way to train all the time. And I think it's easy. It's a great hack because more people will show up to that than will show up to like a, a one you do at your house or whatever. Yeah. But I like to like kind of supplement it. So you do that every week and just cover little small bits of information, you know, then I, I do like monthly something bigger. So like, and I do think, and this is just my opinion, I don't know what other people would say. I think student ministry should be, have more training than almost any other area. And I think it goes back to what I said about it's a bigger commitment because there's just more things you're on the front lines with. You know, our student ministry talks about sexuality in the Bible more than anybody else in the church, you know, and that's just one category. You know, they probably talk about depression and anxiety more than anybody else in the church. And so these amazing, awesome, small group leader volunteers are having to be leaders, teachers, friends, mentors, counselors, none of which Logan. most of them, yeah, <laughs> theologians, exactly. And so I do think more training could be there. So I would be for something like you're doing where it's even a, an extended monthly thing in the, like in kids ministry, for example, I'll say that that monthly might not be any more time. It might be instead of little huddles that they all do by team, everybody comes together and it's a little longer, it's 20 minutes and you hit a bigger topic and then do two big ones a year. That's kind of like my, what I present in the book is weekly huddles, a monthly extended a little bit. And then two big ones where they all come together is probably a meal. I think in student ministry, though, you totally could do weekly huddles, monthly extended, and then more extended. Maybe it is an hour. Maybe it is whatever. And then, um, and I could see the two big ones or one of them could be like a retreat or something. Maybe it is just two big events, a kick off the year, and then like a January. And and um, I think that all together with a good onboarding plan, you know, training them when they start out. That's robust. I mean, you're going to have a great way to talk about all the things you need to talk about. And we, fortunately, we live in a time now where there's so many great resources. You know, we've taken our student ministry team through the um, uh, the Christian Sexuality website. I think it's Christian hyphen Sexuality. And they bring in other voices. So I know they've had Francis Chan and Preston Sprinkle. So like we've done that with our, our student ministry team um, and so many other books. So you've done the lead small book. It's kind of a staple for us. And so you can do that you know, in huddles, you can do that in big trainings no, because they can listen or watch or read on their own, you know, keep it small enough that they'll actually do it. Right. But like, you know, like watch one video that's eight minutes and then we'll talk about that, you know, kind of thing. So that's my favorite plan. Cause it, you, you get to train in different ways and hopefully catch far more people, you know, cause you might only get 60% show up to the big training, but over a span of three months, you should see a hundred percent show up to your huddles you know, enough to get some of that content. Right. And I think you make such a great point about that because everybody's level of learning is different. I, in my younger days, would overwhelm people. Like I would show up with like paper, like, <laughs> like binder. 50 page book here. <laughs> 50 page. Here guys, here's, here's the stuff. You're going to learn all these things. And like, you know, I, I was just like, a, I was an idiot. Like I was thinking to myself, I was trying to like, make everybody a youth pastor and not everybody on your team has yeah. your job and nor should you give them what you should be doing is your job. And you're saying the breaking it down of an, of an eight minute video discuss those little small, little micro things that you do are helping equip your team, equip your team. Because if you do walk in there with a binder or a stack of papers or a six hour training video or whatever you're doing, it's too much. The, people want to serve at the level that they can serve where they don't feel like they have to be your job. They don't, you know, they don't have to do everything you're doing to do, be effective and to, and to minister. Cause really that's what volunteers want to do. They want to volunteer and make an impact. They don't need to know everything all at once. And, and I just think that that mentality you bring of these small bites a little bit bigger bite, and then twice a year, let's have a, a banquet uh, or a buffet of mm -hmm. all the things that we're going to talk about that are going to come up this year, something like that. So as we kind of begin to land the plane here a little bit, but I would ask this, one last thing that you that I read in your book, you talk about structuring uh, your volunteer team to give away ministry, which I love. And you already mentioned some of it because within the context of your teams, you have these coaches uh, that are coaching other volunteers. So if you could break down then, what does that look like to structure your team in such a way where you're actually giving away, you're not just giving away jobs per se, but you're giving away ministry opportunities, which you talk a lot about opportunities yeah. in the book as well, which I think is great. Yeah. And I like that phrase, we give ministry away as a value at a church that I um, 
uh, worked with years ago and I love it. It's just a great phrase. And the whole, that was the idea. It was like, Hey, we're not going to hoard all the ministry ourselves and do it all ourselves. We're going to give ministry away. It's a nice way of saying, you know, we give other people authority and responsibility and all that. I think it, it really does just, there's so many elements to this, but the core part is if you have enough volunteers, which would, in my mind is more than eight or nine or 10, which, you know, a lot of youth ministries don't, you know, cause maybe you've got 40 students, you've got seven volunteers, you're good to go. Even there, we, we could give some ministry away. So I'll come back to that. But if you have more than 10, in my mind, you're already at the point where you can't care for all of them as well as you would like. You know, there's a, a book, there's some books by Carl George, a guy that used to write about church growth barriers and things like that back in like the 80s and 90s. And yep. uh, they're good books. I mean, like even though they're 40 years old or whatever, they're awesome. And in there, one of the concepts he talks about is span of care that most people can only, you know, care for eight to 12 people. And he was kind of writing to like pastors of churches of 120, where it's like, hey, pastor, if you're going to grow this and reach more people, you you got to give ministry away in a sense. Like you can only care for so many people. But the same thing applies to student ministry. If you have 23 volunteers, ideally, you wouldn't directly lead all of them. Now, most of us do. And I did. I did it in kids ministry when I had 60 volunteers. It was very unmanageable. You know, people were definitely not being cared for. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. It was not good. And I was a lid to the growth of the ministry. Like when we fixed this, it grew and it sat, but it was stuck, you know, for a year or two before I figured it out. But in student ministry, let's say you've got 23 volunteers. Even that is an example where you could have, say, three leaders that lead seven people or so. And, they, and their teams. And I like to just make it a common sense structure. So like in our church, you know, and, and you know, I mentioned the coach meeting that we had last night. Part of that was because we've kind of let this slide a little bit. Like we still have coaches, but they weren't leading at quite the same level. Um, our student ministry actually needs new coaches because so much had changed since before. So, you know, we're like everybody else. Like we, we're still clawing back in some ways to what we used to have pre-pandemic. And this is one of those examples. But at its peak, and what we'll get to again, our student ministry had a middle school girls, small group coach, a middle school guys, small group coach, high school guys, high school girls, mm -hmm. uh, and then a large group coach. And, you know, the middle school girls coach led all the middle school girls, small group leaders. And there were six of them, you know, same with the guys, uh, same with high school. And then our student pastor led those coaches who led those volunteers. And it practically, you know, it looks like He's communicating communicating to the coaches probably early in the week, Monday, Tuesday. They're communicating via email to their teams. They're all saying the same thing. Mostly they're saying what he told them, right? Like it's not that different. But who, you know, who you get communicated to from is kind of who you perceive as the leader. So he communicates to the coaches, they communicate to the team. And the key is just to recruit them one at a time. I mean, sometimes you a great coach is a former small group leader. Uh, sometimes they don't want to give that up. And so you you end up finding somebody who doesn't even serve in student ministry. And it's yeah. like, hey, you may not be interested in leading middle school boys, but would you be interested in leading adults who lead middle school boys? You know what I mean? And and some a lot of people would say yes to that, and they may not say yes to leading a group of middle school boys. So the um that's a that's a chance to build that in. But even if you don't have like let's say your ministry is forty students, seven leaders, you don't feel the need for a coach because like I got seven I got seven leaders. Where I would encourage you to give ministry away is then with some of the other things, like who leads your events, who could lead all the events team. Like, you know what I mean? It's not you, you work with them. You do a lot. They're not just doing your job, but you lead somebody and they're like your event coordinator for student ministry. Who's your trip coordinator? You know, who's the hospitality coordinator for, you know, so you're, so in that way you're giving, you're probably giving away a little bit more tasks and projects and responsibilities but still, that's giving ministry away. That's a good thing. Ideal, and as it grows, you have to do both. You have to give away tasks and projects and and those kind of things, and you have to give away authority. And if you do that, then you can you know build a a structure that's more sustainable, especially as it grows. And I've just found, I mean, it's not it's not a guarantee. It's certainly not magic. I think it's biblical that, like you see in the Bible, that when ministry is given away. Um, there's growth. There's the, you know, Israelites are cared for better because Moses put in leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds. Uh, in the New Testament, the gospel spreads and the number of priests were being added to the faith daily because they give ministry away to the seven. So I do think there's a principle there. I don't think it's a guarantee, but I do think it's like that growth follows that leadership where we're, we're giving some of that authority away. And if without it, in my experience, 
you can stunt growth for a long time and not even know why. Like, what's going on here? See, we got a lot of volunteers. Looks seems like it's going well. Church is growing. What's happening? And then it's like that hidden thing of structure that's getting in the way. Yeah. And yeah. You, you're the one that's getting in the way. You're, you're <laughs> yeah. eventually going to look and say, that's, that's on me. Yeah. That, that's my problem. That's not volunteers problem. I'm, I'm the problem. <laughs> I'm the problem. Yeah. Love all of that. Because uh, if you're, if, and that once again, that applies across the board, small churches, medium churches, large churches, just because you're in a small church doesn't mean you have to do everything. You can ask people to do other things. You oh, you ask, should. Yeah. Yeah. You can ask so, them to lead, do all the things that you, you want them to do. Yeah. You work yourself out of a job in a sense. And you know what happens? You get other jobs that help the church. That's right. You know, and I know there's some people that's like, um, this isn't as common maybe in youth ministry, but in, in children's, I see that where, especially at larger churches where it's like, you know, like that church I mentioned, we work with the 30 next gen staff. I'm sure there's some of their part-time staff and kids thinking, well, if I get volunteers to do all this, what do I do? Like, where's my job security? And my point is in a good, healthy church, they give you other good jobs that only you can do at that point. Like you keep giving volunteers what you can and there'll be more opportunities for you to serve in other ways. You know, like our, our youth pastor, this is not normal. I don't, this, maybe this is normal. I guess it is kind of normal, but in our size church, it's probably not normal, but our youth pastor um, leads our social media stuff. He runs events. When we do these food truck events, church wide, he leads that. And he, you know, obviously he preaches at times, hosts on stage very regularly, probably our second most common host. And that is somewhat common for youth pastors. But part of the reason he can do it at our size with our amount of staff, because we don't have a high number of staff per number of students, um, is because he's given ministry away. You know, like it wouldn't be possible for him to do all that if he was still doing all these other things within student ministry. And so is there such thing as a church that would then let you go? Maybe, but I don't, you don't want to be a part of that church anyway. You know what I mean? Like 99% of the churches I know of, they recognize good leadership then you can work your way into some other things too. And the thing I love about it is you can sort of cater it to what you love to do, like give more away of the things that you're not as gifted at, or you don't love as much. That's right. And then, you know, focus more of your time on the things that you are gifted at and you do love. That's right. Delegate your weaknesses so mm -hmm. that you can do more of the things that you love to do. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, I, and, and, and in recognizing that, uh, it's a, you know, you guys that are you girls that are listening and watching, if you devote time to building good volunteers, that's a skill. You are skill building. You are, you are effectively designing your own resume because if all you can put on a resume is that you're good at games or even communication, those are fine. You can do those things. But if you put on there that you lead a volunteer team of 20 people, that's a skill. That's a, I'm not yeah. saying games aren't, aren't a skill, by the way. I'm just saying there's not a great job market for that. But yeah. if you are, <laughs> if you are, if you are saying that you can lead a team of people, you are effectively building your resume and saying, look, I am, I'm advancing myself by upping my uh, abilities and scaling myself up to work with volunteers. It's the same thing with parents. The more you work with parents, that's a skill. You know, if you work with students, that's great. But if you can help and manage and work with parents, that's a skill. Working with volunteers, that's a skill. So, yeah. I mean, you know, Paul, that I've worked with the Slingshot Group helping churches hire staff. And when I talk to student pastors that are interested in getting another job, now this is just me. So I'm not necessarily speaking on behalf of all of Slingshot here, but sure, sure, the sure. things I care about most are what's your volunteer team look like? How many do you have? How do you lead them? What does weekly? And I ask like, how does, what does your weekly program look like? But what I'm really asking is how do you run it? Like who does what, like, are you doing everything or do you, are you leading volunteers to do everything? Because I, you know, that's what churches want. They want leaders I and mean, more and more like, you know, I think there's still churches that want, how would yeah. I describe that? They want the voice. They want the, the, the teacher, the stage person. Yeah. They want the girl on stage that is dynamic and community, great communicator. That is still a thing. Oh, yeah. But more and more, I'm seeing churches that like they want the leader. They want the leader and they they want the stage presence to be good enough. But if they had to pick and I, and this is a question we kind of ask, yeah. like, where would you rank leader versus like teacher or communicator? A lot of them are ranking leader above. And I think it's just because they know if the person's going to be successful and lead at their church, then, you know, they lead leadership needs to be a top gift, uh, yeah. maybe even more so than what they can do from stage. 
Yeah, if you look, and most of us, look, most of us are not stage people. I mean, look at us. I mean, look at me. I mean, I just look <laughs> in the mirror. Like, we're not going to be stage people. We're, 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 in, we're, we're in ministry for a reason here. That's we're right. That's right. For a reason here, Paul. <laughs> uh, that, exactly. And so, listen, not everybody can be stage people, but everybody can be a leader. Everybody can yes. do the thing where you can manage people and you can do those things. So, you know, you know how many, the small percentage of people that are going to just be, you know, the, the stage presence or the, or, or whatever that may be, the influencer, that kind of thing. Uh, but you know, the real, the real work's being done by the leaders who are stepping in every week and, and managing people and uh, yeah, putting out fires and yeah, you know, avoiding fires and, you know, all the things that are with that. So as we, as we wrap up our time, Nick, is there any, any final words of um, encouragement to youth pastors uh, and, and, thoughts on, you know, volunteers and, and those type of things. Yeah, I would say thanks for the work you do. Oh my gosh. Is there a bigger king kingdom impact than serving in student ministry? I don't know. And obviously for different people that their faith journey, that those key moments in their life may not be in middle school, high school, but for so many people it is. And for so many of the students in your church, it can be, and it's hard. Oh my gosh. It's so hard right now. The conversations, the messiness, the, the things that you're having to deal with. So I just would encourage them to keep at it, keep going. It's making a difference even when you don't think it is. And this recruiting stuff is hard. And the hard, the harsh truth is you do have to actually work a little harder on the front end. Now, if you're going to recruit more volunteers, like if you're sitting here thinking, I do need to recruit more volunteers, you are going to have to put in some more hours for a few months because some of the things we talked about, you probably have to build, you have to design an orientation and, and launch it. And you have to, get prospects from the database and, and write this email and start contacting them and start having conversations. And so more than normal, uh, there's more work actually to do on the front end. But if you can do that and maybe even stop or pause some things to give you more time to do that, then eventually in a few months, you could just be doing two hours a week on it. And and, and it's kind of like on maintenance mode, as I call it. And you'll have weeks where you don't do any time. Like you're on a stu- you're on a trip that week. You don't do any recruiting. That's great. And you come back the next week and you get back at it again. And and if you do that, if you can put in that time on the front end, build this system, and then just maintain it, you'll see a difference. You'll you'll recruit more volunteers. And you know, it's again, it's not a magic thing. It's not just a formula. Like there is nuance to it for sure. But the more people you talk to, the more people you have a chance to recruit. And this process just gives you a way to do that. It also gives people a way to say yes to smaller steps along the way. Instead of, hey, I'm, hey, Paul, I'm Nick. Would you like to serve for the next seven years in student ministry for two and a half hours a week, a couple trips a year? What do you think? Yeah, you know, that not as- Sign me up. <laughs> yes, yeah, sign me up. A <laughs> little more difficult than, hey, how'd you get here? What's your experience feeling like? Hey, we're holding a student ministry orientation to talk about what we do there and wouldn't know if you'd be interested in attending. And there we pitch the vision. You know, if you could do that and put this into practice, you could see a difference in your team for sure. And just imagine the future, you know, when student ministry isn't you having to do all these things. What if 80% of what you do is done by volunteers a year from now? Like that's absolutely possible. Yeah. And, and and you'll pick up some other things and that'll be good for your ministry, good for the volunteers, good for you, great for the students. Yeah. And imagine, imagine your workload is 80% of what you do is ministering to volunteers. If, mm-hmm. if that's, yeah. If that's right. Where you're, where you're scaling up to that, to where you listen, you're not doing everything for students all the time, but you're pouring yeah. into those adult leaders. So, yeah. And there's even like this, I mean, our, again, our student ministry, uh, even at 120 students, our student pastor can be fairly involved in a lot of students' lives personally still yeah. Um, because of what is happening with what volunteers are doing. It couldn't if they weren't doing those other things. And there is a point, you know, you get 250 students or something where that's not as true anymore. Yeah. But there's still some space for that, which I, I love. Like you still get, you know, a little bit of all the worlds. So you get to spend a majority of your time with volunteers, like you're saying, but you still get some time with students and free time with parents. And and that's that's the goal. That's the goal, right? As opposed right. to that kind of that Pied Piper, I'm just doing everything, which is most of us. I mean, I've certainly been there many times. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, listen, for those that are watching, those who are listening, listen, the book is the Volunteer Playbook. It is, if you read this book, I'm just telling you, it's going to change the way you think about volunteers, about recruiting volunteers, about maintaining volunteers, uh, about releasing ministry to volunteers. 
where can they go get the book, Nick? And give me all the other things where people can can find you, find uh, the material and yeah. all the good stuff. Because there's a lot of good stuff. I've checked it out. There's a lot of good stuff out there. So Nick, give, give us your... Uh, Give us all the addresses and things. The best place is go to volunteerplaybook.com. It just redirects to a page on my site. And from there, you can click and get it from Amazon. You can get the print or the Kindle or the audio. If, if people like audio, um, you can kind of, if you want, you can get two for one. If you buy the physical copy or the Kindle, there's a link in there where you can get the audio version free. It's kind of like a private podcast, but it is on Audible. Uh, which that was a process, by the way, that was very hard to get it recorded to their specifications. Like, and I do a podcast like you do for seven years. I thought I got the gear. It's going to be great. That was hard. Um, but the other reason to go to volunteerplaybook.com is you, there's a bunch of, there's free resources that go along with every chapter. And if you want, you can access that. And so there's documents and files and just things that we've used at our church. If, if that would be helpful to people. And then um, I blog and have a podcast at my nickblevins.com site. And then a lot of what's in the book actually was and still is courses with Ministry Boost. Ministry Boost is something we started about five years ago to help kids and student pastors. We've kind of found this niche where most of what we do is with volunteers. I mean, we have courses on elementary large group or new to youth ministry or whatever, but I mean, gosh, three quarters of what we do is probably around this volunteer thing. And so it's kind of funny because that the book, the volunteer playbook is probably like six of our courses in in the book. You know what I mean? Like the, that chapter is a course, that chapter is a course, those three chapters are a different course. And um and then but putting them in the book was something I've been working on for a long time, 10 years unfortunately, uh because I felt like I wanted it to be more accessible. You know, I want it to be cheaper, easier to get. A lot of people love to learn through books, especially nowadays when you can listen to books. And I just want to help as many churches as possible build healthy volunteer teams. Nick, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. And thanks for sharing your uh, your your thoughts and ideas on volunteers. Uh, those of you that are listening, those that are watching, go out and get this book. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it.